So what is PIDS? For over 40 years, the Philippine Institute for Development Studies or PIDS has been the country's foremost socio-economic think tank. It conducts rigorous and objective policy research and analyses that help the government in crafting relevant policies, plans, and programs in support of the country's long-term vision and development goals. PIDS pursues its mandate through three basic programs research, dissemination, and outreach. Through its research program, PIDS identifies and prioritizes studies, develops proposals, and conducts research on priority areas. The results of these studies are then disseminated through different platforms, publications, online resources, PIDS Corner Seminars and the Development Policy Research Month or DPRM held every September. To shed light on key policy issues, the advice and expertise of the Institute's research fellows are also sought by policymakers, government agencies, private sector, and civil society. Since 1977, PIDS has completed numerous policy studies on a wide range of development topics. This brand of service has then translated to policies and programs that have improved the lives of every Filipino. Philippine Institute for Development Studies. Service through policy research. Recording in progress. Do you want a digital library that you can access for free anytime and anywhere? You don't have to look far. Serpy is here for you. Serpy is an online database of socioeconomic materials produced by the Philippine Institute for Development Studies. Government agencies, research and academic institutions, and international organizations based in the Philippines. It is the country's first online repository of socioeconomic information, created for policymakers and development practitioners, researchers, educators, and students. To access SIRP, just visit the PIDS website and click the SIRP widget under the Databases tab or type serp-p.pids.gov.pa. SIRP has a wide variety of materials such as journal articles, books, research papers, working papers, policy notes, audiovisual materials, and more. As of 2022, SERPI has more than 60 partner institutions contributing knowledge resources to the database. SERPI provides comprehensive coverage of references encompassing 22 research themes. Labor and education, gender and development, poverty, technology and innovation, trade and industry, and many more. On the enhanced website of SERP, you can filter your research by keyword or author, publication type, research theme, or year published, all at the same time. SERP has more than 7,000 publications and audiovisual materials that you can access and download for free. What are you waiting for? Visit SERP now. Social Economic Research Portal for the Philippines, Innovating Knowledge Exchange and Policy Research. Dapat po munang alamin or matukoy ang pangunahing problema ng bansa upang mapagtuunan ng pansin at mabigyan ng solusyon. We should have a specific goals, um, do research, and Make a policy that is fair for everyone. Walang problema sa polisiya. Iayos lang ang pagpapatupad. Bago patubas ang batas, pag-aralan mo na gusto ng government. Two things, clarity and execution. Both, you need the communication and monitoring, monitoring, monitoring. As simple as that. Mandato ng Philippine Institute for Development Studies o PIDS na gumawa ng mga pag-aaral at pananaliksik ng mga polisiya at programa ng pamalaan at magbigay ng rekomendasyon sa mga mambabatas sa pagbabalangkas ng mga polisiya ang makakatulong sa ating bansa. Sinusulong ng aming ahensya ang evidence-based policy making 
upang bigyan din ang kalagahan ng polisiya na batay sa datos at policy research na sumusuri sa tunay na kalagayan ng ating mga komunidad. Napakahalaga ng policy research, lalo na sa mga panahong dumadaan sa krisis ang ating bansa. Kapag polisiya ay pinag-aralan, susulong ang bayan! So economic think tank. It conducts rigorous and objective policy research and analyses that help the government in crafting Welcome to the PIDS webinar series. Before we start the webinar, we have a few reminders. For attendees, your microphone is automatically muted upon entry. If you wish to join the discussion, use the chat box. Click the chat icon at the lower part of your screen to access it. Then, type your name and affiliation and your question, and send it to hosts and panelists. Please make it concise and direct to the point. For Facebook viewers, use the comment section. You may send your questions while the presentation is in progress. The moderator will read the questions during the open forum and cover as many as possible depending on the available time. 
We will screen all questions to ensure that they are relevant to the presentation. This webinar is being recorded and live streamed on the PIDS Facebook page. The recording will also be made publicly available on the PIDS YouTube channel. Thank you for joining us and we look forward to your active participation. Good afternoon everyone and welcome to the PIDS webinar series where we feature our policy studies and the insights of government policy makers and program implementers, industry experts and practitioners, scholars and civil society actors. With this webinar series which we started in 2020, we hope to provide an accessible venue for evidence-based discussion of current and emerging development issues. I'm Sheila CR and I will be your moderator. Friends, we will be discussing another relevant topic this afternoon. So from agriculture, agricultural uh, modernization, which was our topic last week, let's go to health, particularly the quality of health care being delivered by our hospitals. To start our conversation, may I call on our president, Dr. Anisat Orbeta Jr., to open our virtual event and give us more information about today's topic. Sir? Thanks, Sheila. Uh, good afternoon and welcome to our webinar. Let me begin by acknowledging the presence of the following who choose to be with us this afternoon. From the government, we have National Academy and Science and Technology Academician William Padulina, Philippine National Police Hospital Administrator Michelle Diparini, Directors of the Office of the Cabinet Secretariat Senate of the Philippines, Department of Science and Technology, and uh, nutrition, Food and Nutrition Research Institute. From the private sector, we have Bicol Access Health uh, Centrum Chief Operating Officer Eric Juanelio, administrators of the uh, Pilsaga Mining Hospital and Clinica Gachalian Hospital. Uh, directors of uh, Cereville Medical Clinic, uh, Divine Mercy, Divine Mercy Wellness Center, as in Home Finders Management and Development Corporation, and Sandoz Philippines Corporation. From the academe, let me acknowledge the following, the Polytechnic University of the Philippines, Dean Lincoln Bautista, uh, directors, assistant directors, and executive directors from the La Salle Medical and Health Sciences Institute, Batangas State University, Pablo Borbon Campos, University of Visayas, and Universidad de Santa Isabel. From CSOs, NGOs, and INGOs, we have the Australian Embassy Second Secretary, Abigail Bark Baker, uh, President of the National Nurses Association Incorporated and the Philippine Hospital Association, Executive Directors of Lorma Community Development Foundation Incorporated, and Meticulously Justified Delivering Service to Humanity Incorporated, and Masaganang Sakahan Incorporated Director, Daniel Agostin. Just to greet our friends from the media, and let me also greet our guests, uh, colleagues from government, academe, civil society, media, private sector, and those watching the PIDS and CERP Facebook pages. Our topic for today uh, highlights the importance of providing quality healthcare for Filipinos. The Philippines uh, healthcare system has always faced uh, challenges, including the uneven distribution of health workers and the insufficient number of health facilities. Thus, for many years, improving the access to healthcare services has remained one of the top goals of the health sector. As the health system provides households with better access to health services, the country has made significant but modest progress in improving uh, healthcare outcomes. However, it lags behind its regional peers in different health measures. Clearly, it's not enough to improve the accessibility of public uh, health services. We may have enough health facilities and personnel, but it's also essential to consider whether patients want to avail themselves of their services. In developing countries like the Philippines, healthcare access has increased, but health outcomes have barely improved. Studies say one factor contributing to this poor healthcare is quality. COVID-19 uh, pandemic has exposed these issues and further weakened the country's frail health system. This public health crisis serves as a reminder that access to affordable and high quality healthcare is a fundamental human right. To improve the health system in the country, 
a PIDS policy note that uh, underscored that the government must ensure that health services are not only uh, available and affordable, but also accessible and acceptable to households. The Department of Health or the OH is responsible for ensuring uh, access to basic public health services to all Filipinos through the provision of quality health care and the regulation of providers of health goods and services. As part of this regulatory function, the DOH issues licenses to public and private health facilities before they can operate. It is to ensure that hospitals follow the health and nutrition standards set by the department. This afternoon, we will be featuring two PIDS studies that look into the country's quality of health care and nutrition. The first study, authored by PIDS Senior Research Fellow Valerie uh, Gilbert Olip and Supervising Research Specialist Jana Ui and Research Analyst Lyle Daryl Casas and consultant Christian Eduard Noivo examined the structural measures of healthcare quality in the Philippine, in Philippine hospitals, such as management, practices, and service capacity and readiness. It will, uh, they will share the uh, challenges reported by our hospitals and provide recommendations on how to equip them better to provide quality uh, healthcare. Meanwhile, the second study uh, authored also by uh, Mr. Casas, uh, Ms. Uy, and uh, Dr. Oli, look into the quality of hospital nutrition in the country, another important aspect of improving health outcomes. Specifically, the paper assessed whether the Philippine hospitals deliver high quality, nutritionally appropriate meals for inpatients, adhere to the minimum meal allowance budget, and follow the minimum, minimal nutrition and di dietetics services uh, uh, and process and standards. To enrich the discussion, we will also hear from our implementers. We have invited a health and nutrition experts from the government uh, and public hospitals to share insights on how to improve the quality of healthcare provided by the, our, our hospitals. From the DOH Health Facility Development Bureau, we are joined by OIC Chief of the Policy Planning and Program Development Division, Dr. Terence uh, John Antonio, and Dietary Advisor, Ms. Josephine Giao. Meanwhile, we have uh, Mr. Aldi Fajardo, Nutritionist uh, Dietitian 5 at the Philippine Children's Medical Center. We are deeply honored to have you at this webinar. To our attendees, we appreciate your presence and continued participation in our webinar series. And I'll give back the floor to our meditator. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Abeta, for setting the tone for our discussion this afternoon. Uh, friends, uh, feel free to use uh, the reaction button to express your emotions about the presentation or the ideas that will be shared by our speakers and your fellow participants. And of course, you are all welcome to join in the conversation by using the chat box for your questions if you are in Zoom and the comment section if you are attending as a live stream viewer on Facebook. Okay. Before we started the webinar, we run a poll on Facebook and Zoom to know your pulse on the overall quality of service being delivered by our hospitals. And here is the result that we got from our Zoom and uh, participants and Facebook uh, viewers. Okay, so let us look at our uh, at the poll results. Okay. Okay, so uh, most of our uh, most of you uh, rated the quality the overall quality of service delivered by Philippine hospitals as average. Okay. So okay, with that, um uh, let us listen to our speakers as they talk about the empirical evidence they found from their research about the readiness and capability of our public and private, private hospitals to provide quality health care and nutrition services. And as mentioned by Dr. Orbeca, uh, two studies will be presented today and the authors of those studies are flashed on the screen. Uh, they include Dr. Val, Val Ulep, uh, Ms. Chana Uy, uh, Ms. Lyle uh, Casas, and uh, Ms., uh, Mr. Christian Edward Nuevo. And uh, the first presenter is Dr. Valerie uh, Gilbert Ulep, who is a Senior Research Fellow at PIDS and the Director of the Institute's uh, Research Projects on Health and Nutrition. He is also a Senior Researcher at the Ateneo School of Government, and prior to joining PIDS, 
He worked at the World Bank offices in Washington and Delhi. He was a doctoral fellow at the University of Toronto's Center for Global Health Research, where he conducted economic studies on tobacco taxes. He provided technical assistance to a number of um, international organizations and have received a, and has received awards, including the Nikkei Asia and Emerging Voices for Global Health. He holds a PhD in health economics from Canada and a master's degree in epidemiology. After Dr. Ulep, we will hear from uh, Mr. Lyle Barrel Casas, a senior research analyst at PIPS who is working on public health, nutrition, and health systems policy research. Lyle is a registered nutritionist dietitian and is currently taking his master's degree in epidemiology at the University of the Philippines, Manila. Previously, he worked as a researcher for the country's national nutrition surveys. Dr. Ulip and Lyle, the floor is now yours. Thank you, Ma'am Sheila. <clears throat> Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. So, good morning, everyone. So, um, I would before I present our studies, I would like to thank my colleagues uh, and family at the PIDS for for mounting this event. So, the title of of uh, our studies assessment of the capability and readiness of Philippine hospitals to provide high quality health care. So as Ma'am Sheila mentioned, I authored this paper with Jana Uy, um, Alal Casas, and Ian Nuevo. So next slide. So here is the outline of uh, my presentation. So number one, we'll just um, go through uh, a bit of the introduction, then the objectives, then methodology, key results and uh, conclusion and recommendation, at least for the first study. And after that, um, Lyle will present uh, the key findings of another um, um, relevant study uh, uh, connected to quality of care, uh, entitled an assessment of the quality of inpatient meals uh, and nutrition and dietetics uh, processes in selected public health, uh, sorry, public hospitals um, in the Philippines. So next slide. I think we should start with defining what quality is, right? Um, if you look at the, the literature, there are many definitions of quality. Um, but the idea of quality um, is the ability of the healthcare system to provide um, and achieve the desired health outcomes. So this definition is actually um, uh, um, followed um, using the Institute of Medicine's um, understanding of what quality is. So IOM or Institute of Medicine is basically one of the authorities in medical care and quality of care. So I just want to highlight the word uh, or the operative word um, health outcomes or improvement in health outcomes. So healthcare will not improve health outcomes if they will not, if the healthcare is not aligned with clinical standards or clinical evidence, right? Even if we're keeping getting healthcare if they're not aligned with standards or they're not um in in yeah they're not aligned with standards or evidence you cannot improve health status or health outcomes so if we follow this definition um excess healthcare services are considered waste like for example too much mri too much unnecessary tests or too much antibiotics are considered a suboptimal quality of care so here um, quality of care is, is now being recognized as an important pillar for us to deliver um, or to achieve health outcomes uh, according to the WHO. Next slide. So in the Philippines, um, in, um, in the past, most of our indicators used to measure the performance of the health sector is all about quantity or access, not much about quality, right? A glaring example, for example, a, a glaring example is prenatal care. So all of us working in the health sector, one of the common measure is you need to have at least four prenatal care. And that would that that would suggest that you know uh, we are our health system is actually good, right? Um, we use number of prenatal visits, which is a quantity or access indicator. But we seldom look at quality of services that being provided during prenatal visits. So for example, almost 90% of children in the Philippines has at least four prenatal care, right? But um, but when you try to, to, to tease out what is binibigay during this prenatal care visit, you will be surprised that a lot of standard 
or evidence-based services that should be provided are not being given, right? So this is one of the hypotheses that we are actually posing that maybe the health outcome is modestly improving because the quality of care is not at par with standards, right? Okay, slide. Next slide. Okay. In recent decades, most of the policy actions and programmatic actions of the country are towards improving access. And that's understandable, right? Because we, we needed that. We needed more facilities, right? So, for example, the Health Facility Enhancement Program, the Human Resource for the uh, Health Deployment Program, or the expansion of Bill Health benefits are mostly improving access, right? But the quantity of, or the uh, and yeah, it, the quality of care is seldom um, um, described in, 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 in these policy actions or programmatic actions. Next slide. Okay. Um, but we need to think of quality too, right? As, as um, Sir Babes mentioned a while ago, um, it's an important driver of health outcomes. Because even if you increase access or the quantity of healthcare services, but the quality of healthcare um, is low, health outcomes will never improve. Even if you keep going to facilities, but you're not getting the right healthcare services, you will not, will not improve our health status. In my opinion, there are three reasons why quality of care will become more important than ever. Number one, as income grows, we are moving towards an upper middle income countries. Uh, uh, an upper middle income country. And when you move into that income level, people will demand for more quality care, not only quantity, but high quality care. So it's not all about access anymore, right? So there's a political decision that we need to take, that we need to improve quality. Second, the UHC law outlines the need to improve quality of care. So there is a, a, a huge section in UHC law um, thinking about quality of care and how we achieve it using innovative ways through incentives, grants, etc. So we can anchor that. Third is globally, if we examine mature health systems, right, or let's say just Thailand, there, are, there is a growing use of compliance and value-based financing, meaning the use of financing through, for example, insurance system to demand quality of care, not through unnecessary compliance regulation. It's not all about, you know, just let's regulate the, the quality, but they're now using value-based mechanism for or to drive quality of care. Next slide. Okay, for example, if we examine the value-based financing program in the U.S. Center for Medicare and Medicaid, they pay hospitals if they report quality of quality data, right? Um, they reimburse um, hospitals, for example, if they um, achieve a certain quality outcome indicators. Um, if you are performing bad, like for example, high readmission rates, high infection rates, you will get less. So in other words, hospitals earn more money if they ha have higher quality of care and earn less if they are bad performing. Um, next slide. An example of this is in the UK National um, Health Service. Here, they benchmark the performance of hospitals um, through um, standard global um, um, uh, quality indicators. And this could inform actually the reimbursement or incentive that hospital they get. So I think my point here is that there, there is an incentive for, for providers to be better, um, um, to provide better quality of care, not just submit quality data for compliance. It's actually part of their process. It's part of their it's part of their financing. So that's basically the main message here. It's not just about compliance, right? Next slide. Okay, in the Philippines, I would classify our policies and programs on healthcare quality into two. Number one is passive and compliance driven. So our regulator, in this case, the Department of Health, ask our hospital bunch of indicators to comply to licensing or accreditation standards for, uh, for PhilHealth, for example. These data are seldom analyzed to improve quality of care or used to inform financing. Hence, this approach, I will call it passive, uh, passive engagement or passive um, um, uh, use of quality data. Um, hospitals only you know, comply um, to this blindly 
um, yeah, just for, for the mere compliance. Um, but the data should be empowering. I believe that the data of the hospitals are not there for DOH compliance alone. They should use it to help them assess their performance and the data compliance to DOH or to PhilHealth, for example, is just secondary. Hence, we need to change the paradigm of collecting data in hospitals because they need to use that. And the, the, the submission to DOH is just um, uh, secondary. Second, our data that being collected pertains to quality is structured based. We do not measure critical interactions like processes, um, um, interactions of provider to patients, um, and outcome-based measure. So most of our quality indicators are very structured based and not the standard or globally standard um, measures of quality. Next slide. This, this slide just shows, shows you um, the, the magnitude of accreditation. So hospitals seek accreditation because of various reasons, but, but mostly for financial incentives. So when I say accreditation means that the hospital um, achieve a certain standard or quality. So in the case of PhilHealth, once a hospital is licensed by the Department of Health, it's automatically accredited. And there, and, um, there used to be another level of accreditation in PhilHealth, but they actually remove it because a lot of hospitals uh, could, could comply. Next slide. Okay. Now let's set the framework of our study, right? So according to Don Ebadian, uh, there are three components of quality. Number one, structure. Second, processes. And three is outcome. So when you say structure, these are the readiness of, of or the readiness or um, minimum inputs necessary for healthcare facility to function. Processes are, uh, these are content and manner that the care is delivered and whether it's aligned to technical guidance, clinical guidelines, or conducive to creating positive patient experience. And third is um, patient satisfaction with care improvements in health outcomes. So there are three major components of quality of care. Next slide. In this study, the general objective is to assess whether hospitals in the Philippines have necessary structure and inputs that facilitate high quality healthcare services, right? So uh, the specific objectives are the following. Describe the management practices of hospitals in the Philippines. Describe the service capability and readiness of Philippine hospitals in terms of health information system, health workforce, medicine, equipment, and technology. Unfortunately, we will not examine the process and outcomes because we need proper infrastructure to do this. But we admit this is part of our work plan in the medium to long term to develop these standards indicator or to measure at least the standards indicator. Next slide. In terms of methodology, DOH and PIDS rolled out a health facility questionnaire through DOH um, existing platform. So we covered 467 hospitals and we aim to cover all hospitals in the Philippines um, um, in the next few months. So the questionnaire um, contains the following. Number one is management, so maturity of managerial practices for operations. So we just try to contextualize, contextualize the world management survey for hospitals. Second is on human resources for health, so field position, contractual st st staff, continuous education, and turnover rates. So we also examine um, uh, basic infrastructure, the presence of electricity, water, sanitation, and basic um, uh, infrastructure. Uh, technology and medicine, so we examine functional equipment, laboratory, and the presence of essential medicines in their pharmacy. Um, health information system, whether they use electronic medical records, if they have internet, etc. And lastly, whether they actually measure health outcomes, like presence of quality assurance activities, monitoring of specific quality indicators such as surgery-related mortality, preventable admissions, readmissions, etc. Okay, next slide. This is just the distribution of sample um, health facilities um, uh, um, or the 469 facilities. There appear to be a systematic difference across level and, um, and ownership. Next slide. So, okay. So we now look at the results of the some subcomponent of structure, governance and administra ad, um, administration. So under that, there will be two subcomponents, management practices. And second is financial health. The financial health of hospitals, we will not be presenting because there is a, a separate paper on this at PIDS um, that we release uh, together with this, this, this paper. So if you want to, to look into that, you can download it. The, 
looking at the financial health of hospitals, looking at different data sets also. Next slide. Okay, let's let's um, pin down the uh, the management practices of hospitals. I just want to explain that if you when you talk about um, management of hospitals, uh, sorry, management administration of hospital, there are five things to, to examine. Number one is patient flow. Two is clinical pathway and protocols. Third is monitoring of performance management, target management, and talent management. So when you say patient flow, these patient flow pertains to the movement of patients through hospital. So it reflects efficiency of medical care, physical design, and internal systems in place. So poor patient flow occurs because of faulty admission scheduling system exacerbated by suboptimal physical layout, for example. Uh, poorly managed patient flow in hospital could lead to overcrowding, and this is actually linked to you know, um, uh, uh, poor patient safety and poor quality of care. So hospital with poor patient flow have higher readmission rates and mortality rates, for example. Number two is clinical pathway. Our initiatives aim to organize and standardize the processes, sequences, and timing of interventions by health worker for a particular diagnosis in hospital. So this will also improve patient safety, healthcare quality, and efficiency. Another aspect is monitoring of performance management. This is related to continuous improvement of hospital performance. So important elements include proactive engagement of senior hospital managers in the decision-making and problem-solving activities. Um, it includes empowerment of staff and creation of feedback mechanism to deliver high-quality care. And the presence of, for example, um, monitoring of performance, um, a real-time monitoring of performance in hospital. Uh, another important aspect under management is setting targets, which is um, which is a mechanism that motivates managers and staff to achieve specific organizational objectives. So it it, it has become an important method of driving perform performance uh, improvement. So this includes benchmarking, comparisons, etc. And lastly, one aspect of management um, is talent management. It's a process of attraction, development, and preservation of health workers. So studies have shown that implementation of good talent, talent management in hospital um, enhances the clinical skills of health worker, increases their work satisfaction, improves specialized skills, and increases organizational efficiency, and reduces waste and unnecessary care. Next slide. Okay, so let's start with the first domain, which is um, standardization of care. So as you can see here in the Philippines, while the hospital layout is part of hospital licensing requirements of the Department of Health, a significant number of hospitals based on our survey express challenges in the physical layout of their hospital, potentially compromising patient flow. In our study, only 70% of hospital respondents reported having optimized health hospital layout throughout their facility. In terms of clinical pathway, that's a second figure, only 50% of hospital respondents um, having form, uh, reported having formalized patient pathway in their facility, while only 77% reported that major processes are standardized using, using clinical evidence. However, in our opinion, an in-depth analysis is needed to, to understand the degree of adherence to these clinical pathways. Next slide. Now let's look at the performance management, right? So um, proactive dialogue between senior managers and staff to identify um, and solve problems is critical. So also hospital reports that they solve um, um, also, hospital report that they solve problems right away. However, if you look at um, um, this data, 70% of local government owned government hospitals and private hospitals use multiple indicators to track performance. Ideally, managers should have access to a wide range of performance indicators such as patient quantity, uh, patient efficiency, and um, um, uh, quality indicators. As you can see here, the private hospitals um, uh, um, has among the lowest in terms of um, measure uh, the, uh, uh, the presence of systems to um, measure hospital performance. Next slide. An overwhelming here, an overwhelming majority of hospitals in the Philippines have quality assurance systems. But if we examine specifics um, or specific activities to assess them, 
such as uh, 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 an important mechanism to, to assure qualities, for example, um, uh, inpatient management and death reviews, right? Um, it goes down to 70 to, pers uh, to 80 percent. We noted lower levels in private hospitals. So they do not, um, uh, a significant number of hospitals do not perform inpatient management and death reviews. Next slide. If we also examine um, if they collect and measure standard health outcomes indicator to measure performance, we, 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 saw, a, a very, a lot, it, we saw a very low rate. For example, only few hospitals, both public and private, measure these standards quality indicators, such as 30-day post-discharge mortality, readmissions, avoidable mortality. Right? In other countries, for example, Thailand or Malaysia, these are standard indicators. But in the Philippines, only 30% of our hospitals are measuring this. And if we look at the quality of this data, we don't even we, we, we suspect they are not also reliable, right? So um, we, we, we cannot somehow measure this very critical um, quality indicators um, um, pertaining to mortality, readmissions, or avoidable mortality, right? Only 30% of our hospitals do measure those indicators. Next slide. In terms of talent management, only 70% of hospital respondents um, reported having performance target. So however, we observe large difference across hospital ownership. So routine meetings and consultations to revisit and readjust goals and targets are effective practice towards inclusive hospital management. However, only 60% of hospitals have regular meetings to revisit performance target. Only 60% of hospital respondents have a benchmarking system, which in other countries are doing this, right? Um, with local government owned having the least share, which is 43%. However, our findings require deeper assessment to determine the quality of benchmarks, right? So for example, in the US, they have um, a tool to measure whether hospitals are benchmarking um, themselves properly, right? So um, we needed more assessments on that, right? Next slide. Okay, um, one aspect, so let's move now into talent management. So one aspect of talent management is hiring and ensuring sufficient staff mix. That is having uh, a system that allows the management to determine the needed health workforce and having the full control to address such need. However, in our study, around 65% of hospital has such system with large variation across ownership. Um, the percentage of hospital with system to identify good or bad for performers are actually very, are, are relatively low at around 50%. Next slide. So now let's move into, so that's the management, right? Um, and administration. Let's now move into the service capability and readiness. So next slide. I'm sorry, can you go back again? So under this, we will be tackling these three areas, health information system, um, um, the presence of health information system, the presence, uh, I mean, the, the quality of healthcare workforce and medicine and technology. Let, next slide. Okay, let's now start with health infrastructure. Um, here, all, all hospitals um, surveyed in, 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 in this study have some form um, Okay, so this one is for, um, sorry. So here, let, let's start with, with um, so th this one, sorry, is for communication and health information system, right? Here, tw based on our survey, 20% of hospitals have no electronic medical records, right? 20% have no medical records. But again, we need to assess the quality of these electronic medical records. So if you look at the presence of functional equipment, Few hospitals do not have X-ray, ECG, and ultrasound equipment. Um, while, um, while all facilities have laboratories, a few hospital, 8%, do not meet standards for their facility level or have functional sterilization equipment around 18%. So a few hospitals um, do not meet standards in terms of laboratory. And I think we just need to, to um, take note of the only 20%, uh, on, uh, about 20% of hospitals do not have electronic medical records and they still use um, paper-based um, um, uh, tools or systems. Next slide. Okay, um, let's now move 
Again, this is also infrastructure. So looking at power, water, water disposal, and ambulances, you can see here that while all hospitals um, have electricity, um, only 31% have reliable generators, right? So if you look at the WHO, it's one of the measures of resilience, right? That all hospitals should have functional generators. Um, but in the Philippines, 31, I'm sorry, um, a big chunk of hospitals um, have unreliable generators. Another important aspect is the presence of um, 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 access to clean drinking water. So 30% have no access to clean drinking water. Highest proportion with access is the private hospitals, while the lowest is LGU hospital at 50%. So for water disposal, um, you know, 39% uh, of them and 24% uh, of them have access to landfill. And for ambulances, 80%, 86% have at least one emergency vehicle and meet DOH standards, right? Next slide. Okay, so now um, let's look at um, health human resources. So here, many hospitals are not meeting the required staffing standard as suggested by the Department of Health. And one finding that we've seen is high turnover rates um, especially for nurses. So for general physicians, lowest filled position is the national hospitals, which is the DOH retained hospitals at 75%. Highest turnover rate also is obser was observed for national hospital at 12.5%. For nurses, less than half um, or 42% meet the staffing patterns for nurses. Uh, for that's a whole hos uh, hospital system in the Philippines, lowest filled in private facilities for permanent slot at 85.6%. We have also see high turnover rates for facilities for contractual nurses in, in private hospitals. So turnover rate is basically higher in private hospital um, at 22%. Next slide. Now let's look at um, the availability of um, essential medicines. So according to WHO, these 16 hospitals that, that, that you see in the right um, side of this figure, all these drugs should be available. All, 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 all hospitals should carry these drugs, right? 16 drugs. However, only 3% in LGU, 3% of LGU hospitals surveyed curry, curry have these, um, have, have the complete essential drugs, right? 55% for public national hospitals and 20% in private hospital. In other words, um, kokonti lang yung nakikerry ng, 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 uh, uh, I mean, complete uh, drugs, right, uh, some of hospitals. So here we also um, examine how many hospitals have reported any, um, any stack out, right? Um, and we've seen 48% um, of private hospitals have reported 29% for local government hospitals and 29% in public national hospitals. Next slide. Okay, so I'll just summarize the, uh, uh, the conclusion and provide recommendation. Number one is for governance and administration. Um, standardization of care, not a common practice in local government and private hospitals. Um, both public and private hospitals do not use relevant quality and efficiency indicator in measuring their performance. Significant number of hospitals do not practice systematic target management. And for service capability readiness, few hospitals lack basic equipment. Um, uh, under HR, less than half of the hospital meet the staffing pattern, high um, turnover rate, especially for nurses in private sector. And for drugs, essential drugs are not available in some local governments and private hospitals. Um, and lastly, healthcare quality, usually on health outcomes, are not usually considered in monitoring health system performance. Um, for this, ne next slide. Okay, for for our recommendation, there are only two recommendations that we describe in the paper. Number one is to systematically collect and measure a wide range of quality health indicators. And one of the leaders for this is the Department of Health. So the Department of Health should lead the development of comprehensive health information system framework standards. I, I, I wanna understand, uh, highlight the word standards so that we will be able to capture comprehensive elements of healthcare quality not only structure-based, but also interactions, processes, and outcomes. Number two is similar to how developing countries are doing, you know, um, hinge um, quality of healthcare to financing. So leveraging PhilHealth and its ability to provide grants for them, for hospital to submit healthcare quality data. 
And two is to design provider payments to leverage quality, like provision of incentives and this incentive in this incentive, right? Um, I know this is um, far um, discussions yet, um, but I think it's important for us to move into that direction as many mature health systems are doing, um, leveraging quality of care um, using financing tools and not usually or less on, on regulatory compliance. So um, I think this is the end of my presentation. I will um, give the floor to, to Lyle for our next study. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Vau. So good afternoon, everyone. I will be presenting the key findings from the relevant study on healthcare quality, focusing on the nutrition care in Philippine public hospitals. So this study was conducted a response to the request of the DOH HFDB and in partnership with FNRI on select sections of the analysis. So I would like to thank my co-authors in this study, Jana Oy, Dr. Val Ulep, Dr. Imelda Agdepa, Angel Dr. Imelda Agdepa, Dr. Eva Goyena, Ma'am Josie Desnacido, and Ma'am Maylin Cajuco. So first, I will briefly run through the context, background, and methods of the study before the discussions on the key findings, conclusions, and recommendations. So just to note, uh, this discussion paper was published last December 2021, and we acknowledge that the DOH HFTB already took the initial steps to act on the recommendations we will be presenting on this paper, which they might expound more on later during the discussion. So next slide, please. Okay, so next slide. So first, uh, let us start with defining what is inpatient nutrition care. So inpatient nutrition care is a defined set of activities that enables the provision of patients' nutritional needs during hospitalization. So the goal is to maintain and improve health of the patients and stakeholders by providing high quality, safe, and nutritious foods at minimum cost. Quality nutrition care in hospitals is critical as this is when patients are in most need of good nutrition for their recovery. So poor dietary intake for inpatients that results in malnutrition can lead, of course, to longer recovery time, higher risk of complications, or worsening of patients' health during admission. Next slide, please. So in Philippine public hospitals, nutritional care is provided through the hospital's nutrition and dietetics service. So to, the, to support um, the public hospitals in achieving the goal of NDS, the DOH instituted a national policy, which is the Administrative Order 2016-0020, standardizing a minimum meal allowance of at least 150 pesos per patient per day and at least 1,800 calories for meals. In addition, standards are provided by the 2019 NDS Manual to monitor and evaluate the alignment of hospital NDS units to standards in areas such as staffing, food service processes, and outcomes monitoring. Next slide, please. So for this study, uh, this study examined whether Philippine public hospitals uh, complied to the minimum meal allowance as mandated by the policy after five years of implementation, provided inpatient meals with adequate nutritional content, and lastly, followed the minimum NDS structure and process standard stipulated in the NDS uh, management manual. So our conceptual framework uh, for this evaluation is based on the DOH policy adopted to a wider Donabidian framework for quality, similar to what uh, Dr. Val presented earlier. So this framework conveys that, is, that it is important to investigate the structures or minimum inputs necessary to the functioning of the hospital NDS. So um, service-capable NDS should be able to provide patients with meals of adequate quantity and nutritional content through the systematic processes that also ensure the food quality and uh, food safety. And then good patient outcomes are then uh, facilitated when patients consume the meals as intended and receive good nutrition during their hospital stay. So just to note, uh, we do not focus on evaluating nutritional outcomes um, as data on these indicators are sparse and very uh, difficult to collect. So we were only able to assess whether the hospitals have started uh, collecting any data related to patient nutritional outcomes. Next slide, please. So in partnership with the Department of Health, a self-administered survey tool in protected MSXL format was rolled out to all public hospitals in the Philippines. So the questionnaire asked about the NDS structure, human resources, the status and challenges in the implementation of the policy, food service system processes, and hospital cycle menus. So the descriptive uh, analysis were generated us using data by the PIDS study team and uh, the uh, nutrient adequacy analysis section of the paper 
uh, of the hospital cycle menus were generated using IDES by FNRI. Next slide, please. Okay, so to present uh, the key results, uh, first, for the sample characteristics, next slide, please. The final sample included 193 hospitals, of which 33% uh, are DOH-owned or DOH-retained hospitals, 10% are LGU-owned and um, LGU-owned level 2 and 3, sorry, and then 67% uh, are LGU-owned level 1 hospitals. So on average, uh, DOH-owned uh, hospitals are older and have higher bed capacities compared to LGU-1 level. LGU level 1 hospitals, and majority of the level 3 hospitals in this sample are DOH-owned hospitals. So uh, more than half or 68% of the included hospitals are located in the national capital region and Luzon. So we just want to uh, note that the results for the DOH-retained hospitals are representative while those for the LGU-owned hospitals are not. However, uh, we believe that the results are already revealing about what could be the state of the other hospitals. Next slide, please. So first, under um, financing, under the structures, uh, it is found uh, that the public hospitals are having difficulty meeting the minimum meal allowance of 150 pesos per patient per day. So only 51% of the hospitals met uh, the minimum meal allowance budget in 2021. So this study revealed that there is a slow compliance to the policy over the years. So before uh, the policy was instituted or in 2015, only 10% of the hospitals earmarked to the 150 pesos minimum meal allowance and right after its implementation in 2016, compliance increased by only 4 percentage points. And now, 5 years after its implementation, compliance reached 51%. Uh, and this improvement uh, in compliance mostly came from the DOH hospitals. And we can see that there is a large gap in the proportion of meeting uh, the budget between the DOH and LGU hospitals. So the top reasons reported why they were unable to comply were uh, first, there is a limited uh, budget in the NDS of hospitals, and there is a higher cost of commodities in the area. So also, um, um, majority or almost all of the hospitals perceive that the 150 minimum meal allowance is insufficient, and it needs to be updated to keep up with the current context. Next slide, please. Okay, so on governance or management under structures, this study revealed that the meal allowance is largely influenced uh, by the hospital administration. So this means that the allotment of resources for the NDS will be largely influenced by the admin and their buy-in is important in lobbying for additional resources. And um, in terms of procurement, our responsibilities are decentralized in the NDS through the chief nutritionist dietitians. So um, this study, showed that the most used procurement mode is shopping at 62%, which may be uh, one of the reasons for the higher prices of food items. Inefficient planning of menus may be one reason why the hospitals result to uh, shopping or emergency pro procurement, of course, because if the menus are not planned well, there may be food items that need to be bought in emergency as it was not part of the pre-projected list of food items. Next slide, please. Okay, so on human resources for NDS under structures, uh, we found uh, that the public hospitals needs more uh, human resources specifically for NDS and opportunities for training. So uh, similar to the result earlier for the overall healthcare quality of hospitals, only half of the public hospitals met uh, the staffing pattern for NDS staff in which uh, LGU level two and three hospitals have the least uh, proportion meeting. So this may result in a higher number of meals to supervise per staff per working day. So we can see that in LGU level two and three hospitals, one nutritionist dietitian and one cook supervises 210 and 201 meals in a working day. So this is the highest compared to the OH and LGU level one hospitals. So what does this, what does this mean? So having a high workload may influence the working performance of the staff in which in turn may affect the quality of meals served in the hospital. So in terms of training among the NDS staff, only the nutritionist dietitians usually have the opportunities for training. And then the top reasons were of course, the lack of budget and then the schedule conflicts with the current um, routinary work uh, in the nutrition and dietetic service. So uh, the opportunities for training are also important, not only to the nutritionist dietitians, but to chefs, 
to the chefs, to the cooks, and to the food service workers as well, because they are heavily involved in the delivery of quality meals, especially uh, in the meal preparation, considering food safety and quality measures. Next slide, please. Okay, so on the assessment of the quality of meals, uh, this study revealed that not all the hospitals were able to meet the prescribed nutritional content of planned meals, especially for the LGU hospitals. So only 40.2% of the hospitals met uh, the prescribed 1,800 energy requirement or 1,800 calories for uh, the regular adult, uh, regular adult diet. So LGU level 2 and level 3 had the lowest compliance at 21.1%, while the DOH hospitals had the highest compliance at 44.1%. So this means that uh, the prescribed 1,800 calories under the policy uh, instituted by the DOH is not being met by half of the hospitals. So in terms of the micro macronutrient content, all the hospitals did not meet the acceptable distribution range for carbohydrates, protein, and fats. So nevertheless, um, there was a high compliance on protein requirement at 78.2%, while the lowest compliance was uh, at carbohydrates at 29.3%. And this pattern was similar across uh, all the different levels of government hospitals. And in terms of the micronutrients, the lowest average micronutrient content was generally observed among the LGU level two and three, while the DOH hospitals had the highest proportion meeting all the micronutrient recommendations. So the, pub the problematic micronutrients, which seemed to be the least met, were calcium, iron, riboflavin, and vitamin C. So since all levels of government hospitals have limited resources, they may be prioritizing meeting the macronutrient and energy requirement than mi micronutrients and uh, with a special uh, emphasis on protein, which is a very uh, important uh, macronutrient for recovery. So just to reiterate that the cycle menus or the planned menus were the... Uh, uh, menus evaluated, not the actual meals, because uh, weighing of actual meals served was not possible given the risk of conducting the data collection on site in hospitals. However, if the cycle menus or the planned meals were already short of nutritional content, as this study revealed, this may reflect that the situation is worse than when actual meals are to be evaluated. Next slide, please. Okay, so on assessment of patients for their uh, nutrition, nutrition status, uh, some hospitals does not have uh, the basic equipment uh, to be used. So only 33% uh, or one-third of the hospitals have both weighing scale and stadiometer. Thus, uh, some of the hospitals may not be well equipped to do regular nutrition assessments to patients. Regarding uh, the select food service process standards, the public hospitals in general were not able to adhere to the process standards. So first, um, on recipe standardization, 37% uh, of the hospitals have no standardized recipes, and this may reflect inconsistent amount of meals served. So inconsistent meal portions may lead to, again, emergency purchase of additional ingredients outside the projected quantities, which can contribute to the higher price of the food item because uh, when you uh, do this, the food items will be bought uh, in retail price. So the highest proportion, lacking standardized recipe, is coming from the LGU level 1 hospitals at 47%. Uh, so in ensuring uh, food quality, only 14% do all the three given standards. And uh, usually, the, hospital, uh, the hospital's miss is the food weighing of cooked food for portioning. So this is connected to the... Uh, lack of a standardized recipe and be, since they are not able to weigh the food for portioning um, we see that that may be due to the high quantity of meals to be to be prepared so they usually skip this process uh, to save time so for food safety almost all the hospitals do the given standard except for the use of the color-coded utensils. So the use of color-coded utensils is advised for the prevention of cross-contamination during meal preparation. However, only 36% uh, 36 of the hospitals in this sample does this. So again, all of these uh, may be rooted to the limited resources available for the NBS. Next slide, please. Okay, so in conclusion, I would like to summarize uh, 
this study. So our study found that the Philippine public hospitals need more resources for better structure and inputs to conduct the processes to achieving its objective. So the hospitals were unable to meet the minimum meal allowance per capita and the required nutritional content of planned meals. The hospitals need more human resources and learning and development uh, opportunities. The hospitals need to lobby to also to administration for resources. The hospitals need to have a procurement mode choice. Uh, I mean, the hospitals have a procurement mode, mode choice that may have opted for higher uh, food item prices, unable to meet uh, food service process standards, and had monitoring and evaluation initiatives still in its infancy. So disaggregating by hospital type, uh, the most unequipped uh, hospitals were LGU-owned hospitals, which may also reflect a socioeconomic inequity in the provision of quality nutrition care. So these LGU hospitals are managed by LGU since the decentralization in 1991, and most of these hospitals have few resources, resulting to poorly equipped and poorly staffed facilities. So as a result, unequipped LGU hospitals catering the poor may be providing suboptimal quality nutrition care and this would not improve if not worsen the patient's uh, poor nutrition status at baseline. So last slide. Uh, thus, uh, we recommend first to uh, review the policy on standardized meal allowance or uh, the adjustment of the meal allowance budget. And the policy should consider the reasons why some hospitals were not able to meet it because increasing it plainly would not guarantee uh, the hospitals uh, meeting it because of uh, the budgetary constraints. Next, uh, the policy should also advocate to the hospital administration the importance of allocating resources to nutrition care, and this study revealed their influence in the NDS budget. So next, the policy should strictly enforce compliance to the updated nutritional requirements and food service processes. So another our recommendation is to capacitate the RNDs or the registered nutritionist dietitians on better and more efficient meal planning and procurement practices provide uh, learning and development interventions to other NDS staff, not just the nutritionist dietitians. Update of the new staffing pattern for NDS should be advocated to provide more plantilla positions for our NDS HR. And lastly, consider uh, the revision of the current monitoring tools for the NDS vis-a-vis -vis the standard set to strengthen our MNE initiatives and efforts. So that's it for my presentation. Thank you very much. And thank you very much, uh, Dr. Val Ulip and Mr. Lyle Casas for your comprehensive uh, presentation. Well, the findings of your studies clearly show that there's really um, a lot to be desired in terms of uh, the quality of care being delivered by our hospitals. And this was uh, observed, as we have seen in the presentation of Lyle, even on the nutrition and diet dietetics uh, services of our hospitals. So, and... Um, most of our hospitals are not measuring quality indicators for care, and uh, sadly, the health sector does not consider healthcare quality in monitoring health systems performance. Okay, so we will hear more from our speakers, from our presenters during the open forum. Um, in the meantime, let's go to other uh, reactions of our panelists. So we have three panelists who will comment on the studies' uh, findings and recommendations, and also share their. Um, insights on how to improve the quality of care and nutrition services delivered in our hospitals. And two of them are from the Department of Health. Uh, first, let us hear from Dr. Terence Antonio. Dr. Antonio started his career in public health with a focus on hospital operations and supply chain management in Northern Samar to improve the supply of essential medicines and medical supplies across the different hospitals in the province after his graduation from the Ateneo School of Medicine and Public Health. After two years of working in the front lines, he moved to the DOH as one of his technical staff, focusing on developing uh, policies and standards for health facilities. And he was later on uh, designated as the uh, OIC chief of the planning of the policy planning and program development division. Uh, Dr. Antonio, the floor is now yours. Hello. Good afternoon, Ma'am Sheila. So again, good afternoon, everyone. So I'll just share my slide. Bono. I wanted to get the feedback if I'm clear. Yes. All right. Thank so you. 
Again, magandang magandang hapon po sa lahat. No? So, in behalf of our director, Director Maria Teresa Vera, we would like to thank uh, the Philippine Institute for Developmental Studies for inviting us in this forum. So, our partners with uh, PIDS has been um, a very uh, important aspect po in developing policies and assessing standards for quality care through research. In fact, um, this two particular um, research has been a great input in terms of the policies that we will be releasing soon under the Department of Health. So um, for the first particular research, I would comment on um, the, the um, coming from these two main points po that was initially highlighted. So first, um, we recognize that there is indeed a gap in the implementation of standards across health facilities in terms of ownership, particularly on the standardization of care and protocols, non-utilization of quality and efficient indicators of hospitals, and non-systematic target management. And secondly, as emphasized by uh, actually both studies, there's a need to revisit the overall m &E framework for quality, especially the need for streamlining purposes. So we recognize that there are a lot of programs under the Department of Health that um, really measures quality. But what's more important is to see these indicators at a more systematic uh, manner. So in order to address these issues, the Health Facility Development Bureau has been working on improving the backbone of the overall framework that sets the standards for health facilities, particularly in the implementation of the Integrated Hospital Operations Management Program, or IHOM. So I, I'm in to certain um, government facilities or even the private facilities might be a new concept, but this is actually um, up and running since um, around 1998 already. So what we're trying to do is to um, revisit the overall direction for the program. So IHOMP is a program under our um, bureau that ensures the implementation of standards and guidelines aimed to improve efficiency and effectiveness of healthcare services. It likewise prescribes protocols that hospitals should follow in line with the different facility-based programs and standards, which includes the um, in infection prevention control, healthcare waste management, and the like. So in recent times, there's, there's the particular shift is in the overall direction, which intends to expand the program in terms of scope, tools being used, and innovating program delivery. So we also recognize that um, with the overall devolution um, with, with the overall dev devolution transition plan, we really need to capacitate our local government unit in terms of how they would manage health facilities. And this is something that um, um, hopefully would help them in terms of this particular aspect. So this particular program um, focuses on three main strategies. So the first strategy focuses on ensuring easy access to references and capacity building for health facilities. So this enables the program to update more frequently um, the standards and uh, um, policies uh, relative to the current uh, context already. Um, as you can see, over the past um, two years, in fact, we've um, updated overall around nine um, standards or recent standards po, no, since 2019. So that is something that we are also um, trying to cascade also for the next few years, especially to the local government units. Po. Secondly, um, the strategy two looks into enabling good governance and evidence-informed policy decision-making and hospital operations through the use of hospital information system for the collection, processing, and submission of health and health-related data and reports at all levels of data processing by harmonizing data collection for compliance to standards. So what, what we're trying to do is to come up with or provide technical inputs on how these um, indicators or data will be processed at the facility level so that the facility can use this um, um, to improve quality overall. And lastly, the third strategy looks into monitoring and evaluation activities, which um, we hopefully uh, be streamlined so that we can use to steer direction um, in terms of decision making at the national level, policy development and planning. Hence, standards developed are those responsive to the needs of Filipinos and applicable to the Philippine setting. And um, that will be applicable to whether it be government or private um, hospitals or health facilities. So where are we right now at this point in time of the implementation of the program? So as mentioned, um, in, uh, the initial launch of the program started with 1998 and recently with the shift um, in the direction and at the same time, the mandate of the universal healthcare, um, we've been busy um, writing and 
stand, um, updating the standards for health facilities in line with the universal health care. So as mentioned, there are around nine manuals that have been released through this particular platform, po, um, specifically on healthcare waste management, hospital health information management, finance service, pharmacy, nutrition, and dietetics, infection prevention control, emergency department, nursing, and um, even to certain population like sanitary service, all of which are included in the link provided in the screen. So everyone is welcome to access this data or, or this manuals already so that they can help in terms of improving their services um, in all um, health facilities. Subsequently, HFDB is working on streamlining data submission for health facilities through the health facility profiling tool. So I think this is also the platform where the initial data collection was collected for this particular study. So what we're trying to do is to streamline all of these M&E um, frameworks into one platform and try to streamline all of the um, important quality indicators from the dis, um, different manuals and standards. Lastly, to ensure that all standards are cascaded, um, we are currently utilizing the DOH Academy and other social media platforms such as um, YouTube to disseminate or cascade the different manuals and standards. So um, with that, um, I think um, that would end my initial part of the comments for the first um, study. So we also have our I know, um, website that you can visit um, to get to know more about the standards that we are releasing and of course our um, YouTube channel as well in terms of um, information dissemination and policies. So over to you, Mum Sheila. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Antonio. Uh, we appreciate uh, the updates that you have shared on uh, what the OH has done uh, so far to address the gaps um, reported by our speakers. Uh, so at this point, uh, we will now we will now go to our next discussion, who is also from the DOH. So let us uh, welcome Ms. Josephine Giao, Diet Dietary Advisor at the Health Facility Development Bureau. Ms. Giao has vast experience in health nutrition, hospital uh, nutrition, and dietetics. Dietetics uh, for the past thirty six years, she has been recognize and receive uh, outstanding awards, achievements, citations, and recognitions in different associations and other reputable award-giving bodies in the field of nutrition and dietetics. Uh, she finished her Master of Science in Nutrition and Diploma course in Community Nutrition from the University of uh, Indonesia, uh, Southeast Asian Minister of Education and Organization, uh, tropical Medicine or TropMed at Jakarta, Indonesia, and she obtained her Bachelor of Science in Food and Nutrition degree from uh, the Philippine Women's University. Ms. Giao, the floor is now yours. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for the invitation to be part of this public webinar for the research on assessment of the quality of inpatient meals and nutrition and dietetics processes in select public hospitals in the Philippines conducted by PEDS or Philippine Institute of Development Studies and Food and Nutrition Research Institute. I am very enthusiastic that we have completed this research project despite doing this at the height of COVID-19 pandemic, which may have an impact on the variables measured in this study. I am well aware of the challenges that the team, that the team has gone through to be able to gather robust evidence that will help us improve the hospital nutrition and dietetics in our respective health facilities. I'd like to begin my reaction by saying how relevant this study to our nutrition and dietetics programs in the Department of Health, especially for the DOH hospitals and the LGU health facilities. As one of the technical advisors of the Health Facility Development Bureau, it is our mission to provide leadership and technical stewardship for the continuous development of health facilities through hospital nutrition and dietetics. We support the goal mentioned in the study, which is to maintain and improve the health 
of the patient and stakeholders by providing quality, safe, and nutritious food at minimum cost. Part and parcel of promoting good health and nutrition is to provide patient-centered and high-quality nutrition care and inpatient meals of adequate quality and quantity. I commend this study which look into the analysis of compliance to the minimum allowance mandated by BOHAO 2016-0020 provision of inpatient meals and adequate nutritional content and compliance with the minimum NDS structure, process, standards stipulated in the DOH NDS management manual. I would like to emphasize some points relevant to the specific findings present that was presented earlier. We recognize the different levels of implementation relative across the different level of hospitals, although there are still challenges in the implementation of the AO 2016-0020. Still, 76% of the OH hospital were able to meet the minimum budget and 56% in LGU level 2 and level 3 hospital. It is important to note that improvement for level 1 LGU hospital is necessary at 36%. We are in agreement that meal allowance is largely influenced by hospital administration. In general, shopping can be considered as one of mode of procurement in case two bid failures as per RA 9184 or procurement law, as a cost basis, shopping result in lower cost of food items and utilities. Other alternative modes include negotiated and small value procurement who are still aligned with RA 9184. In terms of the training of human resource, while the NDs usually have the opportunities for training, continuing education for other staff such as Cook and FSW are also provided by DOH and DOH League of Registered Nutritionist Dietitian Incorporated. The pandemic has affected the conduct of such training or capacity building. We recognize that most of the hospital meeting the nutrient requirements are indeed DOH hospitals. I would like to emphasize the importance of covering a one-week cycle menu instead of three days to make sure that all nutrient content requirements are representative in the complete analysis of the quality of meals in the hospital. For the food service processes standards, we need to improve on investing basic equipment for conducting nutritional assessments such as weighing scale and stoichiometer. Moreover, the study also revealed that the majority of public hospitals, particularly level one, do not utilize standardized recipes. We agree that is something we, look, we like to look at. Lastly, the regular monitoring and evaluation on patient satisfaction is done by majority of the hospital at 71%. Implementation of NCP or nutrition care process is not yet fully implemented because of lack of trainings for public hospitals due to pandemic. In conclusion, the study has identified the strengths and weaknesses in the system in terms of nutrition and dietetics. Allow me to take this opportunity to inform everyone present today that the AO, and that this AO is the new AO, an updated per capita meal allowance for inpatient has now, has now been ratified and awaiting the signature of the DOH secretary. Moreover, there will be training on nutrition care process for public and private hospitals to cater for the critically ill and nutritionally at least patient this coming third and fourth quarter of 2022. In terms of staffing, the staffing pattern for NDS Phase 1 is already for approval of DOH and DBM. And lastly, the training of ND manual, meal planning, and procurement processes should be prioritized for capacity building. I commend the team for the great efforts in conducting this study. This will be a useful not just for the DOH program, but most importantly, for our patients needing quality nutritional care. Again, thank you and congratulations to PIDS and FNRI. That ends my presentation. Thank you. Thank you very Maya. much. Thank you very much, Ms. Giao. Uh, we will hear more from her during uh, the open forum. In fact, I ha already saw one question that uh, um, she, can, she can answer later when uh, during the Q&A.
Okay. So our last discussant is also a nutritionist dietitian. Uh, he works at the Philippine Children's Medical Center. Is now and is now the national president of the uh, Department of Health League of Registered Nutritionist Dietitians Incorporated, which is an organization of all government hospital R and Ds. Uh, he has a master's uh, degree in hospital administration and public management, and he began his career in dietetics as a clinical dietitian and nutrition educator at several medical centers in Metro Manila. He also worked overseas, where he was exposed to different advancements in the practice of the nutritionist dietitian profession. Let us all welcome Mr. Aldi Fajardo. Thank you very much, Ms. Sheila. I hope I'm coming clear. Yes, very clear. Thank you. Now, good afternoon, everyone. It is my privilege to be part of this public webinar that discusses provision of high-quality health care and the quality of the inpatient meals in selected Philippine hospitals. Let me express my gratitude to the Philippine Institute for Development Study for inviting me and coming up with the research that will always be relevant at all times. Well, the World Health Organization defines healthcare quality based on three elements, effectiveness, safety, and responsiveness. It is essential to track several healthcare quality indicators as the nation implements changes aimed at achieving universal health coverage in order to enhance hospital treatment in the Philippines. Well, the Republic Act 11223, or also known as the Universal Healthcare Act, um, which has been passed by the national government in 2019, offers a comprehensive range of measures that ensures all Filipinos access to cheap and high quality care that is responsive to their needs and preferences. Although there is a problem in low and middle income nations like the Philippines as it needs a standardized tools, harmonized indicators from diverse government agencies and systematic gathering. This has been based on the research that has been presented, where it is stated that monitoring techniques now in use are restricted or limited, also data intensive, and can be very expensive, in addition to the fact that healthcare quality in the country is underdefined or under research. Local government owned and commercial hospitals lack standardized care and protocol in terms of governance and administration, which causes a considerable diversity in medical care. They also show that many public and private hospitals lack systematic target management practices with only 60% of hospital respondents using a benchmarking system and holding frequent meetings to review performance targets. Many hospitals lack dependable and stable communication system like water supplies and service readiness in terms of capacity. Additionally, just 41% of public hospitals adhere to the Department of Health staffing guidelines, wherein the unmet staffing pattern guidelines could result in an increased workload for the personnel, which could lead to a staff turnover and loss of enthusiasm. The survey also found that certain public and private hospitals did not uh, have a vital drugs, which forces patients to use their own money to purchase medication outside of the medical facilities. Uh, they, as you presented, we all agreed that the, the recommendation to create a comprehensive framework for a high for the health information system that will include the component of high quality healthcare, wherein the design that is necessary to be guided will be on this particular framework, and then the, another idea to relate that healthcare spending is equivalent to quality. According to the authors, the, the incentive and subsidies could be used by the government to encourage the gathering, measuring, and reporting of data from the facilities. And moving on to the hospital inpatient meals, which can also be aligned to the hospital quality care system, because as we all know that the study shows a direct relationship of patient stay to his nutritional improvement during hospital admission. We need to acknowledge that the diet Delivery of nutrition service overall in the country is far from being perfect, but likewise, we see a tremendous evolvement throughout the years. Improved dietary functions and its services continue to progress, but we still have to identify gaps that need to be addressed. As the universal healthcare focuses on the primary health system, we hope to see that the nutrition and dietetic service at this level 
be able to comply with the standards set by the respective authorities. We are referring, or this includes, to the logistic or resources, meal planning, and the NDS personnel. A full support with all of these factors from the top management will truly bring change to the nutrition system within an organization. My takeaways from this research are the followings. First, is to strengthen the synergy from all levels and all types of hospitals wherein we can adapt the best practices and smooth transition of patient-protected data to other health institutions that can track previous medical history and medication, which can be an efficient and effective move to manage our patient. Second, to have a customer-centric training for all staff. Of course, we all know that medical, nursing, and allied professionals professionals are always guided through their professional commitment to learn and study new things within their field. But if we wanted to deliver high quality service to our patient or client, we must not forget the administrative or all those client facing personnel such as even the our cashiers, admitting sections, concierge, duty guards, and even housekeeping personnel that can make a big difference in the holistic approach in, in treating our patient. And lastly, that we may be able to see the value in investing in a better nutrition to be able to serve safe and nutritious meal for our patient. Thank you very much for that. And thank you very much, uh, Mr. Uh, Pajardo. Okay, we will hear more from uh, Aldi uh, during the open forum. Friends, at this point, we have heard the reactions and insights of our discussions. And uh, this time, we would like to hear from you again. Okay, so we have come to the next part of our webinar, which is the open forum. But before that, let us have a short break by uh, again running a poll. And this poll is open to our Zoom participants and viewers on Facebook. Okay, so. Um, all of us are recipients of healthcare. We all know that. So all of us are customers of uh, healthcare facilities, such as hospitals. But one thing that seems to be missing in many facilities is getting the feedback of their customers uh, to know what areas uh, they think need to be improved. And uh, Mr. Aldi also mentioned it's important to be um, customer uh, customer centric so we have the following poll question for everyone was there ever a time when a hospital asked for your feedback on the quality of care you received during your stay or visit so this is a single choice um question just you know um is it a yes or a no again was was there ever a time when a hospital asked for your feedback on the quality of care you received during your stay or visit so we are giving you 15 um seconds to answer this question so you may enter your answer now and uh of course we have the track we have our chat box in case you have uh questions for our um for our speakers. Uh, Gwen? Yes, Ma'am Sheila, the poll is now closed. Okay, the poll is now closed. And can you show us the results of the poll? Okay. Okay, a majority of our uh, uh, attendees or participants said, answered yes. So, Ano naman, nakuha daw naman yung feedback nila, uh, perhaps through a survey, on the quality of care they received during their stay or visit in, in, in the hospital. But uh, still, 35% said no. Okay? So, the results somehow give us an indication of the extent to which our health facilities value customer uh, feedback. So, thank you for sharing your thoughts. And as a token of our appreciation to those who joined the poll, we will pick two names from our Facebook participants and also two from Zoom. And each of them will uh, get a prize. And we will announce the winners on our Facebook. Okay, we will announce the winners uh, before we close this webinar. Okay, so at this point, I invite our four speakers uh, to the open forum. Uh, Dr. Val Ulep, Mr. Lyle Casas, uh, Dr. Terence Antonio, Mr. Joseph Ingiao, and Mr. Aldi uh, Fajardo. Okay, so I mean our five, all five speakers. 
Okay, so let us now uh, go to our chat questions. Okay, let us start with um, the question of um, um, Professor Andrew Cesar Rimando. Uh, and this is addressed to uh, Ms. Uh, Josephine Giao. And perhaps um, Mr. Aldi can also we can also uh, get uh, the inputs of uh, Aldi because both of them are, are nutrition dietitians. Okay. He said one of the best ways to lower down cost of food in hospitals is to buy directly from farmers or their cooperatives that can deliver directly to hospitals. Um, this will increase income of farmers and at the same time get fresher pro uh, produce directly from the farms. Do you think this should be institutionalized by government hospitals and also private hospitals? Ms. Yale, may we start from you? Um, yes, actually, we have uh, a program right now with the different agencies. This is called Enhanced Partnership Against Hunger and Poverty, wherein the hospitals directly uh, buy their food commodities to the farmers. Kaya, ano, uh, um, right now, we are still doing this, and some. Uh, I think there are... 13 DOH hospitals right now wherein they really ordered and buy their food commodities to the farmers. Okay. Thank you very much, ma'am. Uh, Mr. Aldi, maybe hear your uh, answer to this question. Yes, tama po si ma'am Josie. Um, this program is targeted actually to help also the farmers. So it's an interagency task force. Okay. Wherein, um, Within the Manila, dito po sa Manila, we, the PCMC actually was trying also to get involved. Apparently, alam nyo naman dito, nasa, we are already in the city. Um, we're in, we wanted to take in directly from the farmer's uh, harvest. So we are having some challenges for the stability, of course, uh, for a standardized uh, menu mm -hmm. plan within the hospital. So, kailangan din merong um, continuity and then um, stability na magiging supply. Um, that is the commitment that we wanted to have from the group of the farmers. Although now, kasi nga, the weather, there's a lot of factors to consider. Um, we are still working it out and hopefully we'll be able to help them. And um, it is ongoing now as what Ms. Giao is mentioning. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Aldi and Ms. Giao. Okay. Um... Okay, I have a question regarding the way uh, we monitor uh, our government, particularly the DOH uh, monitors the performance of, uh, particularly the performance of DOH and LGU managed hospitals. Has there been a move toward um, performance-based uh, subsidy scheme or in allocations to publicly funded hospitals or tied to their performance? Or ginagawa na po ba ito? Um, uh, Val, would you, would you, would you have, uh, an, do you want to start and then we can go to our friends from the DOH? Thank you, Ma'am Sheila. Regarding your question, I'm not sure if we have that. Maybe I'm wrong, but as far as I know, what we, um, we don't have a performance-based, um, mechanism to award or, or incentivize or disincentivize facilities, no. Um, uh, but to me, that that could be done, no? Um, um, using, for example, um, or we can leverage that using pill health. But as far as I know, the Department of Health does not have that kind of mechanism, or I'm not sure if we ha they have the authority to do yeah. that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, uh, Doctor Ulep. Uh, Doctor Antonio, maybe hear your answer, please. Hello. Uh, so I think um, previously there were initiatives um, through the through field health actually. You know, so as mentioned during the lecture a while ago, really quality as um, something that um, health facilities would endeavor um, needs to be paired with certain incentives. And previously, mm -hmm. there was bench book that was being used by field health. So it serves as a accreditation process po kasi before. So um, I think that was um, currently put on hold and um, it is something that we are revisiting as part of the overall overall quality framework. So looking into mechanisms to incentivize um, through health financing po yung ganung process. Um, I hope I responded um, 
okay na po dun sa question. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Antonio. Okay, we have a question here, but I think you already, uh, this was already answered during your presentation from uh, Mr. Richard Mel Capilis. Is the IO integrated, that he is referring to the Integrated Hospital Operations Management Program. Uh, is, it, is it operational today? Uh, he said the eHealth.gov that uh, that DOH, that gov, that PH cannot be accessed at the moment. Well, this was part of your presentation, Dr. Antonio, and you, you uh, mentioned to us that it is in progress. Yeah, so I just wanted to clarify also, I think what they're pertaining to is the Integrated Hospital Operations Management System. So it's a system, sorry. It's, uh, yeah, it's an IT system but that was um, pioneered by the Department of Health that uh -huh. um, looks into parang model po siya na hospital information system. Ah, uh, so yeah, MIS. That is being... Yeah. Uh, that is being developed by um, the Knowledge Management Information Technology Services or KMITS of the Department oh, of Health. So oh, what I know of at this point in time is they're transitioning IHOMIS to UHCIS. Um, so uh, which, which is an information system that will be deployed um, to the healthcare provider network. Um, as to its uh, no, extent of um, development, um, I don't have that personal information. But it's something that is being um, developed on their end. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you very much for the clarification, uh, Dr. Antonio. So it's currently being developed. So we hope to see it uh, up and running uh, soon. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Antonio. And we have another question from uh, uh, Richard Melcapilis. Do, do we have standard and regularly gathered administrative indicators being collected by the DOH from the public hospitals that can be studied to, to determine the quality of hospitals. Uh, Dr. Antonio, and then I'll go to Dr. Ulep uh, later. Yes, yeah, I think um, what's important to ask is any the extent to administrative um, indicators that is being met being asked. So mm -hmm. as far as we're concerned in terms of health facilities, there are two levels of data collection being done at the DOH level. So first is under the licensing. So there's an, an online um, platform that they submit um, as part of the licensing process. Oh, that, that is in compliance with the minimum standards. Po, no? um, on our end, what we're trying to do is we recognize po kasi that um, um, in terms of the de developmental aspect, po, no, um, we want to extend that um, data collection and streamlining the quality indicators further. So that's why we were piloting the health facility profile. Um, this is also in relation to the learning from the COVID um, pandemic that it's important to um, for health facilities to submit certain um, data for quick decision making. So that's a learning from the DOH data collect also as a mechanism for data collection. That's why we're shifting our framework for MNEs. Yun po. Mm -hmm. Salamat po, uh, Dr. Antonio. Um, Dr. Ulep, would you have anything to add based on your um, uh, research? Wala naman, wala naman ma'am Sheila. So everything, so currently the licensing bureau of the Department of Health collects um, mostly structural um, uh, indicators on quality, but not on, for example, processes or mm -hmm. or health outcomes that are usually, if you look at global standards, are being used to assess talaga um, the extent of quality of care. So yun yung kailangan natin gawin, right? Um, um, a, a wide range of quality indicators um, that would allow us to better incentivize or um, disincentivize facilities and you know use that mechanism to to um, finance them, regulate them, etc. So yeah. it's just a small part of, of, of quality you mean a measure at this point. That's right. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ulep. Okay, we have uh, another question. This one is uh, very relevant uh, in connection with the additional resources that will be that our LGUs will receive because of the Mandana's um, implementation of the su Supreme Court ruling on the Mandana's and Garcia petitions. From Teresita Barcelo, with the additional funds coming to LGUs because of uh, the Supreme Court ruling, what does DOH plan to do to ensure improvement of hospital health services? Um, okay, may we hear from our friends from the DOH? Uh, Dr. Antonio, would, would you like to start? 
then we can uh, I, i'll call uh mr miss giao next thank you i think i'll try as much as possible to answer what i can in terms of this perspective so given the limited um scope of what we know as a bureau point but what i know is that there's an um, overall devolution transition plan being pursued in terms of um so yung yung ano po ba yung magiging transition plan in terms of how we would finance also that's part of it secondly um from my understanding for there's the um at least on the facility based level um there's a philippine health facility development plan and there's a um process of prioritization in terms of who else we will be helping moving forward um so meron po siyang metrics po na tinitingnan kung um, sino po prioritize in terms of um, based on their capability or capacity um, as um, determined um, during the study that um, when the Philippine Health Facility Development Plan was being crafted. So, ni prioritization in terms of service cap or capability of certain provinces or region in terms of um, infra development. Um, secondly, in terms of capacity building on health facility operations naman po. So that's why we're shifting also our um, framework in terms of um, capacitating. So we, we are really investing a lot in terms of um, ex expanding our reach in terms of making sure that our standards be taught to local governments po and other stakeholders aside from the DOH hospitals. Over. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Antonio. And may we hear from uh, Mr. Gia, Ms. Giao. Ms. Giao, what prospects do you see uh, coming from uh, the implementation of the Madonna's ruling in terms of improving uh, nutrition and dietetic services in our hospitals? Actually, uh, what I can say regarding Mandanas, we're in the LGU government has the capacity on their own. Now we're in, they can have the leadership regarding finance. Uh, and also they have the capacity of their own to have uh, really improve their quality of health and care. Okay, thank you very much, ma'am. Um, let's entertain a question from Facebook, from one of our Facebook uh, viewers. Um, okay, it's anonymous. Okay, from Prof. Josh. That's his name. Uh, he, he is asking if the findings focuses on the management side that directly affects the delivery of services provided by the dietary by the RND. So what can RNDs propose to their respective hospitals? Uh, I think um, perhaps you can, um, our two uh, nutritionist dietitians can uh, re reiterate some of the uh, recommendations that they've outlined in their, uh, in their talk. Uh, let's start from uh, Mr. Aldi. Yes, basically, if I get it right, the, the person is asking if what can be done by the uh, R&Ds to actually buy in all this concept to the management. If I get it right on that context, I would say we just have to really be assertive enough to actually have a good plan in accordance to uh, what our mandates and be aligned with your, the target of the hospital so that you'll be able to actually uh, have a buy-in with your top management and make sure that uh, at the end of the day, your clientele, your patient will definitely benefit from your programs or advancement that you wanted to implement. Uh, I think the challenge was really to really have up to most of the studies uh, that has been covered, especially for the LGU level two and one, um, it has already been given that there will be a tight financial constraint wherein it can be, uh, it's, it's literally a, a, a function of can we push a program or not because we do not have a fund or is it a priority to actually have that program so that we'll be able to advance in the field of nutrition and uh, dietetic service. So I think you just, the RNDs should just have to be very assertive, make your programs worth it and be able to have it um, 
lay down in a manner that it will be favorable for your clientele. Yeah. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Aldi. Um, maybe hear from uh, Ms. Giao. So Ms. Giao, what practical uh, recommendations or actionable recommendations uh, yeah. can you suggest? Yeah, actually, actually we have uh, a manual, uh, the Hospital Nutrition and Dietetic Service Manual as serve as a standard manual for the operation and the nutrition and dietetic service wherein they could have this as reference for their plans at the same time. Uh, uh, having their strategic plan also and work and financial plan ahead of time, uh, they can also, wherein they can implement uh, other nutrition and dietetics program in their hospital with a, with a, at the same time with a, with a budget for it that should be advocated to their uh, bosses regarding this. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Giao. Okay, let's go to the question of Ms. Miguel Gaston Agkawili, as recommended in a study by Mr. Casas. Is there any developed or established standardized evidence-based nutrition care that R&Ds can reference and DOH can use as quality indicators? Um, back to you, uh, Mr. Aldi. Mr. Aldi. Sorry, I I thought it's a question for me. I thought it's for Lyle, but nevertheless, um, just uh, wanted no, to uh, say. Uh, Miguel was uh, um, referencing um, a a uh, a recommendation in the study of Lyle, no? Okay. And he is yeah. asking if is there any if there is any developed or standardized evidence based nutrition care that you and other R&Ds can reference and the DOH can use as quality indicators. Correct. The DOH already had a department um, order for mm -hmm. the administrative order uh, 2019-0033, if I get it right. That talks about the nutrition care process. I see. Um, although the study of Lyle pra practically um, subjected or delimited to the food service aspect, if we are going throughout to the nutrition care process, that will be a different thing. Um, for now, the DOH is already, uh, we are in the full swing of implementing the nutrition care process and hoping that we will be able to have more programs and capacity building as what Ms. Gia was saying earlier on, mm -hmm. uh, so that we will be able to strengthen that particular skills or areas of the RNDs where in the clinical aspect has to also to be addressed uh, hand in hand with the food service. So technically, yun po yung ating ginagawa din ngayon, and hopefully we'll be ending up with a clinical audit for the nutrition, um, clinical nutrition um, nationwide, hoping with the engagement of not only with the government hospital, but also with the private sector. Yun po. Thank you very much, Mr. Aldi. Okay, let's go to the question of uh, Maria Camille and Andre Harry. And uh, Lyle, uh, perhaps you would like to answer this because this, the study that you did with uh, with your uh, with Dr. Val, no, it's uh, your sample consisted of uh, I think public hospitals, no. And Camille is interested to know whether there has been a study assessing and comparing the quality of inpatient meals and nutrition and the ethics processes in public hospitals versus private hospitals. And if yes, what, what have been the findings and recommendations? Okay, uh, you may have encountered um, a related study or uh, um, a study related to this in your literature review, Lyle. Okay, uh, thank you, Ma'am Sheila, and thank you, Ms. Harry, for that uh, question. So on uh, the question about the comparison of the results between public and private hospitals, our sample only included uh, public hospitals. And on uh, the question with regard to the outsourcing of the dietary services, since the general uh, trend on outsourcing food service in hospitals is uh, very evident on private hospitals, only a few, only few uh, public hospitals do this, do outsource food service uh, dietary component. And in our study, uh, 
uh, we we have a limited sample on this, so we cannot really compare uh, the the outsourced dietary service vis-a-vis -vis the in-house dietary service of the public hospitals. But if you're asking if I would recommend this study, yes, I would um, indeed recommend to look further into this uh, because uh, because uh, we can really uh, compare whether uh, are we really having problems in delivering quality nutrition care when it comes to the uh, type of food service the hospital is engaged in. What I mean to say is, would we uh, notice uh, a noticeable improvement in the quality of nutrition care uh, provided if our services is outsourced? So that's a wonderful question. That, that, that's a wonderful question we would also want to answer in the future if, if we're going to be having a chance to look further into it. Thank you very much, uh, Lyle. Uh Earlier, we had a, uh, a question from uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Rimando, and it was answered by our uh, speakers, no? And his uh, question... Ma'am Sheila, can I yes. add on that uh, statement of Sir Lai regarding outsourcing? Sure, sure. Yeah. Go ahead, ma'am. Actually, as at the Department of Health, we don't recommend outsourcing because we have certain staffing patterns that are approved by DBM. May mga trainings ang mga staff, even in this food service worker and cooks. That's why we don't recommend outsourcing for DOH hospitals and even LGUs. I see. Okay, thank you very much, ma'am, for the time. Masasayang yung mga, saan sila dadalhin pag sila eh, outsource. Hindi kami recommend outsourcing. This okay. is for public hospitals, ma'am, right? No? Opo. Okay. Oh. okay, okay. Thank you for that. Okay, we have a comment here from Miss uh, Judy uh, Pangfrudo, and I, I, he was refer she was referring to uh, one of uh, the earlier questions uh, uh, posed by uh, Mr. Uh, Rimando, uh, wherein he suggested buying directly from farmers or their co-ops. Uh, um, produce no that can be used uh, in um, you know in uh, dietetics and nutrition services for for hospitals no and um, one of our facebook um, no facebook zoom participants said that uh, as much as we wanted to directly buy produce from farmers, the Bids and Awards Committee will only allow suppliers with field ships registration. Even our local market vendors cannot participate in the bidding uh, process. Okay, so he's re she's referring to uh, public uh, hospitals no? uh, who are covered by uh, the bids, uh, our procurement law. Okay. So let us entertain a few more questions. Okay, uh, let me check our... Okay, to Mr. Hmm. Okay. Uh, from Joseph Solis, do you think SUC should really offer allied medical courses like nursing or medical technology to produce enough number of Filipino nurses and medical technologies who will really work in our hospitals as most SUCs in provinces don't really offer allied medical courses okay it's a bit uh, it's a bit a bit vague but uh, okay uh any thoughts from our from our speakers on this uh Val, would you like to take a crack i i think we need to do more analysis on this on the demand and supply of health, of allied health professionals no um i think um yung senior fellow natin um mike abrigo and i have yes. a little bit on, on on this but mostly on physicians etc but we need more parang analysis on the supply and demand for for allied health professionals so it's really hard to come up with with a, a, a recommendation on how do we produce more um nurse, uh, nurses med med medical medics so. that would be a, a very good ano, um uh, uh, research work plan. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you. 
Thank you, uh, Val. Okay, let's uh, go to other questions. Okay. Okay, uh, to Mr. Fajardo, you have said that water is also one of the problems of hospitals. Uh, do you think that hospitals that install water recycling systems uh, to have more sustainable water usage should be given government incentives like tax-free equipment of the systems? The question is from uh, Andrew Rimando of the LCDFI. Hi, Ma'am Sheila. I, I think I could answer that. Or maybe Doc, si, si, si Doc, so Doc PJ, maybe he could supplement it. I think if you look at the Health Facility Development Plan, there is a section there about, you know... Um, incentives? No, not, not, yeah, incentivizing or encouraging facilities to be more um, uh, uh, climate-friendly, how to mm. be more become resilient, etc. And one of that is actually using these kinds of, you know, mechanisms or systems, no? So yeah, I think there is um, um, a big idea on that, but I think the next question is how do we operationalize that and what kinds of incentives, etc. Those things need to be teased out. Pa. But there is a general vision that mm -hmm. we should move into that kind of paradigm, na rin. Um, yeah. like you know, climate-friendly hospitals That's right. or facilities. Okay. Thank you very much, Dr. Olaf. Uh, may we hear from Dr. TJ? Yeah, just, so what I did was um, initially share the, so this is a public document point. So it's the Philippine Health Facility Development Plan where um, Dr. Olaf mentioned about um, um, the overall parang direction in terms of climate friendly hospitals. Po, no? um, siguro, as mentioned, back at this point in time, um, I am. Um, Di pa ganun ka lino din, ano pa yung incentive mechanism. Mm -hmm. um, that would definitely re would require um, additional study plus or policy ano po, no? um, parang teeth para po mabigyan na incentive. But it's something that um, we can further study pa moving forward. Yeah. I'm Ma'am Sheila, one, one point lang din though. Go ahead, go one ahead. Of, so, Thank you. One, one, one point or one of the comments lang narinig namin from the facilities is medyo mahal kasi siya up front, diba? Um, when you, like for example, when you when you avail of these kinds of services. So I think what needs to be done is to do more research. Mm -hmm. um, look at the cost benefit of this um, in the long term, etc. To encourage providers that, okay, if you adapt this, it will, you know, magbabayad kayo, but it it will provide um, um, cost savings in the future. So we need more, we need to do more of those kinds of analysis to us as, as a guidance for for our hospital administrator to adapt um climate friendly um systems kasi medyo mahal siya talaga like for example when you avail um solar panels for example or you know those kinds of those kinds of systems so we need more no, we need more feasibility studies or analysis. thank you very much thank you very much dr ulep uh a while ago we were talking about um uh, uh, because there was this question on uh, producing uh, uh, more uh, health workers, such as uh, nurses and med techs. Uh, Teresita Porcello has this to say, there is really no shortage of nurses, but they shy away from private hospitals because of the poor working conditions, including salary and PP, especially in during the pandemic. Okay, And a while ago, we also had a convo on uh, directly procuring for farmers. And it was mentioned by one of our uh, participants that uh, farmers and, and cooperatives, uh, um, it's very difficult. It's difficult to do this uh, given the procurement law. But Leslie An Leong Anudin said regarding direct purchase from farmers, there is the Sagip Saka Act, RA113. 3 to 1, which authorizes the direct purchase of agricultural and fishery products from farmers and fisher for cooperatives by national and local government. This direct purchase is an exemption from the bidding process. Thank you, Leslie, and for your input. Okay, so let us move to other questions. Um, okay, uh, from Maria Alitalia Villa. Uh, okay, well, he's He's just asking if the recommendations have been submitted to the DOH. Yes, actually, the present spam of the DOH now is uh, evidence that they have heard our uh, the findings and recommendations of the TIDS study. And as mentioned also by uh, Dr. TJ, there have been efforts by the DOH to address uh, the gaps. Uh, um, 
pointed out in the two studies. Okay, so let us go to other questions. Okay, let me just check our our uh, chat box. Uh huh. Okay. Let us okay. Let us go to uh, accreditation, no? Because that was part of the presentation of uh, Dr. Ulia. Because I've seen uh, public, both public and private hospitals that are ISO accredited, no? And in in fact, uh, for for uh, organizations, let's say like the like the PIBS and national government agencies, no, having that ISO accreditation is a requirement for us to get a performance-based bonus, no? Um, is, is this type of accreditation required for health facilities, uh, Dr. Ule? I'm not sure if it's a requirement um, for licensing or accreditation. I don't think it is. No. Um, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. So I think I just wanted to. So I think um, the in terms of licensing requirement, um, it didn't. Exp so first off, the Department of Health encourages um, yung mga ISO um, uh, accreditation po, no, um, as part of the continuous quality improvement framework, which is also also under our ano, under our um, bureau. Um, licensing wise, what it required is uh, to have an in internally uh, a continuous quality improvement uh, plan um, that each health facility should be doing. But as to the specific whether or not they should be ISO certified is is not yet within the licensing um, component. Um, I simply because I think it would be, um, because health facilities had to incur certain costs on their end. Yeah. But nonetheless, mm -hmm. the CQI component is, um, is is still part of the licensing requirement. Um, having the committee, having the CQI plans is, is part of licensing. Um, when um wanted to uh, circle back also with one of the responses about um bench book component of PhilHealth and ISO accreditation. Um, I, I think the fake bench book as at this point in time is currently put on hold. So we're going back to PhilHealth also in terms of the overall direction for the bench book. So they might be able to provide guidance on that as well. Thank you very much, Dr. TJ. Actually, that was uh, uh, related to the comment of uh, uh, Ms. Uh, Ms. Villa. He, she said, with due respect uh, to ISO accreditation, why not enhance and empower the PHIC benchmark as it is more, more of hospital focus criteria? Okay. Ma'am, so, I could answer that, no. I, I think if you look at the, the experience of many countries, kasi, Mm -hmm. um, I mean, go, going back to the bench book muna, bakit siya na-stop? It's because it's really hard for a lot of both public and private hospitals to comply with many quality indicators. Mm -hmm. But if you look at in many other settings, in many other countries, what they do is link the in, link these indicators with incentives. It's right. region ginawa ng, ng bench book. We need... To, there, we need to provide incentives because there is associated costs in mm -hmm. measuring, in monitoring, or improving quality. So yun yung nakakalimutan natin na if you want to implement it, it needs to have, it, it, para na, may nakakabit na incentives, incentives for these incentives. And mm -hmm. that's how it should work. Kasi kung hindi nakikita yun ng facility, it's just another compliant whatever na kailangan gawin, right? But if we link it to something else, then it will change, right? So, mm -hmm. yun yung kailangan natin pag-aralan. How do we, you know, link quality and financing? That's which, right. That's part of our work plan in the, <laughs> in the short <laughs> to medium term. It's a very important point, Dr. Dr. Ulet. And uh, Paul Padilla has this to say, quality management systems is not required in licensing, but a lot join because it will make hospital... Uh, it may it will make hospitals uh, competitive in the market. Okay, um, 
And then Lisa Mahelia Herrera said, it wasn't really hard to comply with the benchmark standards, but it is better if facilities would understand how it works to their yeah. advantage, not necessarily incentives outright. Yeah. Well, I could answer all of that. So that's one also please, one of please, the go comments. Ahead. No? Mm -hmm. Because I think we also need to change our paradigm. Because mm -hmm. the way we do, the way we collect data is as if there is a God and that is DOH or PhilHealth. Okay, we just need to submit. But I think we need to we, we need to change it. That the data is actually should be used by the hospital to change your operation. It you know, and secondary lang yung DOH, right? And I think the function of DOH and PhilHealth is to actually facilitate that, right? And, and providing incentive, etc. Because na, na hindi nakikita ng mga facilities kasi kung ganon na parang compliance mode lage, de ba? It needs mm -hmm. to be part of their daily operation. Like how do they mm -hmm. measure quality? How do they measure mm -hmm. change their HR, etc. So yun yung kailangan natin baguhin. And to me, well, I'm an economist, so incentive para sa akin right. should work, mm -hmm. right? Like that's the that's the that's how many countries do it. They provide incentives. That's right. Um, yeah. In every quality indicators that they collect, in every mm -hmm. quality measure that they implement. Right? Mm -hmm. Otherwise, it's just you know uh, another day of submitting. A bunch of data to fill health or DOH. Mm -hmm. Na di natin alam kung ginagamit nila or hindi. Mm -hmm. okay. And then providing a uh, better, uh, better quality uh, healthcare translates to better revenues for for the hospitals. And I think you emphasized this early on in your presentation when you said that there is incentive, an incentive for uh, healthcare providers to provide quality quality care. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it, 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 it's a global practice. Everyone mm -hmm. does everyone does it. Like when you when your readmission rate is high, Phil Health or DH needs to do something about it using your financing, right? Babawa sa mo yung pera, dadagdag mo yung pera, etc. I don't know. We, we, there, there, there is already like case studies on this that That's we right. can use, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, and Aryan, Diane, and Ninon has this to say. Well, she agrees. She said, hopefully, PhilHealth and LGUs consider quality as KPIs for increase in budget. Okay, let's. Uh, this is this will be our last question. Okay, and this one is from uh, Miss uh, Jasmine Romero. How will the new administration absorb the results of the study if uh, given the chance? Let's say uh, to. Uh, speak before our new administration what do you have to say to them uh regarding uh you know what actionable recommendations can you give to them um pertaining to uh the findings and recommendations of the study uh val may we hear you from you first and then i'll go to the rest of uh, the panel yes thank you ma'am sheila as far as akin, i think number one is link quality to incentives. I think many countries have done it. It's not all about, you know, compliance regulation. Part of that, but I guess the power of incentives and the power of, yeah, the power of in, 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 in incentives could be actually the possible driver of higher quality of care. Right? Second is, I guess, it's important for us to to start examining anong ginagawa din, ng, especially ng private hospital. Medyo blinded tayo sa private hospitals. Right, I think malaki yung variation ng private hospitals. May level one, may level two, may level three, and the variation of quality is is, is just massive. Right, so we need more visibility. Um, we need more better monitoring and evaluation, um, mm -hmm. both for public, especially for private hospitals. So, yun yung kailangan natin gawin for next administration. And all of these are actually anchored in the UHC. So basically, yung kailangan lang gawin ng next admin is to basically implement the new HC law. So, yun lang. You just need to to to, call, to 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 implement that and things will just, you know, it will change everything, kind of, um, from quality to how we deliver uh, um, uh, services, etc. Thank you very much, um, Dr. Ulep. And now, uh, uh, Lyle, may we have your input? Okay, so um, since the institution of uh, NDS policies and standards, um, 
we found that majority of the public hospitals have great difficulty equipping the necessary structures to abide by the process standards, thus make the quality of nutrition care. Most importantly, for the poor who access these hospitals, a problem in Philippine public hospitals. So what's important now is for this to be uh, further looked into and recognized so that um, the, the value of nutrition care and health, overall healthcare quality is uh, recognized and will be uh, further, uh, I mean, the problems will further be addressed given that it will be, uh, it will not be a neglected problem po in the Philippine public hospitals. Thank you very much, Lyle. And may we hear from Dr. Uh, TJ Antonio, sir? So, as, as Any actionable recommendations that you could, you know, give our incoming administration? Um, so, Sigur, just to chime in with the inputs of Dr. Val and Lyle, one of the, uh, again, um, looking into incentives, because that is something that's uh, um, really relevant in terms of quality care. Number two, as mentioned a while ago, Sigur, continuity of um, our current efforts now. So, it's as mentioned a while ago, we're expanding also our scope in terms of standards development um, to even private sector. Po, no? So slowly, um, we're getting there. So um, as long as this particular direction is supported, I think um, we're on the good track, naman po, ma'am. So yun lang for now. Thank you, Dr. T.J. And may we hear from uh, uh, Ms. Josephine uh, Giao, ma'am? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, actually, I have one point na gusto ko sana sabihin kanina regarding yung sa farmers. Kasi, uh, because of this enhanced partnership against poverty and hunger, we have, uh, uh, we're in the farmers directly delivers food for the hospitals. We have this community procurement participation na pinupush ng DSWD para hindi na magbid ang mga hospitals, especially for the LGUs right now. Gusto, gusto ko sana sabihin kanina, kaya alam na alam pas na ba. That's why I would like to mention this. We have this community procurement participation na, na parang mas ano siya sa RA9184 na hindi na magbibid mga farmers. So, regarding uh, ang tinatanong nyo, kasi tumayo ako eh. Hindi <laughs> ko narinig kung ano yung tanong mo. So, kasi I have to go to the bathroom. So, uh, ang tanong mo ba, what will, what will my wish for the opo, incoming uh, um, opo, government? Opo, related po uh, to the question of Ms. Jasmine Romero. Uh, sa, uh, tanatanong po niya, how will the new administration absorb the results of this study? So, uh, to paraphrase it po, uh, yeah. okay, uh, what actionable recommendations uh, you can probably give to yeah. our incoming administration, particularly yeah. po, uh, sa, uh, aspect po ng improving uh, uh, nutrition and dietetic services at yeah. hospitals po. Actually, my recommendation for the incoming administration or whoever man who would take my place because I am looking forward also for my retirement and then continue the effort that has been done and then we have this uh, different AOS that needs to be implemented and should be also monitored and evaluate carefully para alam natin ang stands. And then continue collaboration with the research institution like PIDS para alam natin ang status ng ating mga programs. Okay? And marami po salamat, uh, Ms. Josephine Gial. Thank you very much po. And, and of course, we will be here from uh, Mr. Aldi Fajardo. Sir? Yes, Ms. Sheila, thank you for that. Um, as we move on to the implementation, full implementation of the universal health care, we know naman na marami pang challenges for that. And especially now that we were wanted to actually download it or transfer it to the local government unit, we only have few, I think on the research it was shown, we only have few LGU units that we can have actually mobilized or try to be... Uh, put into as a best practices or a best practice hospital at their level. So there's a lot of things to be done that hopefully um, nutrition will not be far leg behind because we know that the 
particular importance of nutrition delivery in the hospital setting is very crucial and essential as what the research has been mentioned. So I think for me, we just have to keep monitoring and what has been, sabi nga kasi, mag, mag, baka mag, I, I'm not saying baka mag -iba, but definitely it is as if it is up for the new management or rather the new um, administration to really put into to the dynamics of the healthcare system, more specifically nga na dinadownload na yan on a local government unit. Thank you very much. And thank you very much to all our uh, speakers. So this uh, ends our uh, conversation. So please join me in thanking our all our uh, speakers, Dr. Val Ulip and Mr. Lyle Casas of PIDS, Dr. Terence Antonio and Ms. Josephine Giao of the DOH, and Mr. Aldi Bajardo of the Philippine Children's Medical Center for sharing with us their wisdom and valuable insights. Let's give all of them a big virtual clap, okay? And here are the names of our uh, poll winners. Uh, Darren Che Gako, Jeremy Telan, Mark Benjamin Quezon, and Katrina Guico. I repeat that Darren Che Gako, uh, Jeremy Telan, Mark Benjamin Quezon, and Katrina Guico. Uh, so our uh, webinar team will get in touch with you for the delivery of your prize. And finally, we have some reminders. Okay, so uh, you can access um, all the presentations from today's webinar on the PIDS website. So I'm referring to the uh, full uh, studies um, of uh, Dr. Ulep and Mr. Casas, as well as uh, their presentations and the uh, presentation also of our um, panelists, of our discussions, okay? And please answer the feedback survey that will pop on your screen after this webinar. We will also email you the link after the event. Your comments are important for us to improve our webinars. And, and uh, please regularly visit our website and social media pages. We have a YouTube channel where you can uh, uh, you can watch uh, the recordings of our previous uh, seminars and uh, virtual events. And thank you to our um, followers on Facebook who are diligently uh, watching our uh, live stream and also to those who are uh, uh, who tuned in to our Twitter account for the live up updates of this uh, virtual event. And flash on the screen our webinars uh, for next month. Okay, so next week on, okay, Two weeks from now, on July 7th, we will have the uh, webinar on policy insights for more efficient and adaptive social protection in the Philippines. This is a, an event which we are co-organizing with the World Bank. And on July 14, we will have our webinar titled Toward an Inclusive Economic Recovery and Development in the Asia-Pacific Region and Ensuring Fiscal Sustainability in the, Philippi in the Philippines. This is a webinar, um, our webinar with the UNSCAP. And on July 21st, we will have uh, our event on um, evaluating the Philippines Irrigation and Health Insurance Program. And on uh, July 28th, we have another webinar on examining the Philippines' bottom-up approach to disaster reduction and management. And finally, we would like to acknowledge the various organizations from the government, academia, uh, civil society, business, and international development community uh, who joined us today. Maraming maraming salamat po. So this concludes our virtual event for this week. Stay safe, stay healthy, and stay informed too. Thank you, and see you on uh, July 7th. Thank you.